All right, so today we are going to talk about uh, the foundations of democracy. We have just finished talking about the American Revolution and the causes that led to the American Revolution. And now we're going to talk about what happens after the war. So we are, we are pretty much skipping the war. So the very first thing we're going to look at would be the colonial complaints against the British monarch. Um, because what ends up happening with the colonists is we end up having a, on one side, we have a tyrant. We have someone who's abusing his powers to an extreme level, not letting the colonists go places, taking away their governments, um, punishing them unfairly. And the colonists react a, a lot like a, a lot of people would um, to go from a tyrant to the, excuse me, to the completely opposite side of things. So, if we come back out and we make a list of the fact that we had a tyrant king, um, they listed these in the Declaration of Independence. He taxed them without representing them in the, in the in Parliament. He would not allow the colonies to trade with other countries. Um, they, he told them that they could not go west with the Proclamation Line, even though that land had been won in the French and Indian War. He refused to allow them to have uh, fair trials. He said that not only would the judges have to do what he wanted them to do and find everybody guilty, but then also he said that the people had to be put on ships and taken back to England to have a fair trial or to have a trial. And he also demanded the quartering of troops in the colonists' homes. All these things were things that the colonists were very upset about. Um, and so they went from, they, they said, this is the type of government that we have on this side. We have this type of government and we don't want it anymore. So basically the national government was way too strong. Whenever they created their new government, which was a document they created called the Articles of Confederation, a confederation being a friendship. Um, they decided that they were going to do everything the exact opposite of what they had had before. So they said, we're not, uh, whereas before they had a tyrannical uh, king, now they're not going to have any leader whatsoever. Um, whereas they had, they were overtaxed before, now they're not going to have any taxes done by the federal government, and now each state can decide if they're going to have taxes. Also, each state is going to have one vote in their Congress. Um, there's going to be no regulation of trade. You could do whatever you wanted to do. Um, the only success that they end up having under the Articles of Confederation is that the establishment of the Northwest, that's what that stands for, Ordinance. Now, the Northwest Ordinance, it, it does two things. It tells people they can go out to, like, Ohio and, and uh, Illinois. It tells them they can go out there and they can settle, but it, it does not allow slavery out there, which ends up being a big deal later on. Um, this, so, and that needs to have a star next to it because it is the only real success of the, Nor of the Articles of Confederation. They also do not have a court system and there's no military. Now, one of the things that it does say in the Articles of Confederation is that, that, they, that the Congress can declare war, except there's no military, there's no taxes, there's no leader to say, hey, we're declaring war to lead the troops into battle. So... The, Art the AOC, which we're going to shorten it down to, the AOC, the Articles of Confederation, said you can have war, but literally took away all the tools to do so. Basically, what this does is makes the national government way too weak, and it says that state governments are really strong, um, that states can decide things. Like, states would decide things um, like taxes, that these taxes were going to be... If North Carolina, North Carolina said, we're not going to have any taxes. And so we didn't. Uh, but other states, uh, like Massachusetts, said that they were going to have taxes. It was up to each individual state, which is going to end up leading us to an issue. Um, we do need to make a note on the corner of our paper. What is the difference between interstate and foreign trade? Interstate trade is trade that runs from state to state to state. So if I wanted to go buy fireworks from South Carolina, I could get on the inter interstate, I-95, and I could go from North Carolina to South Carolina. Uh, foreign trade would be if I want to buy an, you know, a PlayStation from Japan. Um, that would be foreign trade. All right, so 
Our issue comes to a head when we have a guy named Daniel Shays. Daniel Shea is a veteran farmer. A veteran meaning he had fought in the American Revolutionary War. And while he was fighting, there was no one to take care of his farm. So when he returned to his farm, he's trying to make money with his farm again. However, he had to provide his own food in his own uniform and his own gun during the war. Um, so nobody's taking care of his farm. So he gets back and he needs to immediately pay taxes. And he doesn't have the money. He was never paid. That was one of the things. The American, uh, the American Revolutionary soldiers were never paid. So this ends up, he owes money. He doesn't have any money. And the government comes from Massachusetts. They come and they take his farm away. Now Daniel Shea gets incredibly upset. So he decides to lead a group of farmers um, running around the country, tearing the place up. And uh, nobody could stop him. And it was kind of devastating uh, because everybody's like, oh my gosh, Daniel Shea's running around and n nobody could tell him to go sit down because there is no leader. So what this ends up revealing is that we have terrible weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation and we need to get them handled. Um, but first and foremost is that Daniel Shea, someone needs to go tell the man to go sit down and stop doing this. So George Washington gets on his white horse and he's like, all right, I'll go, I'll go stop him. And he does. He, he goes up there and he's like, Daniel Shea, I need you to go stop. And Daniel Shea says, pretty much, long story short, okay. However, we do need to take note of what these weaknesses in the AOC are. So, here they are. It says, our national government is way too weak. There was no power to get Daniel Shea to sit down. There was no leader that says to, to take control. And we usually want someone to say, all right, this is what needs to get done. Um, and because there was no leader, any laws that they had, like, yes, they could declare war, but who's going to enforce any laws? There's no courts. There's no national taxes. Um, there was no way re to regulate trade. That trade coming in and out of the country, trade between states, it was all over the place. They also said it was way too hard to fix the Articles of Confederation. In order to change the, or, yeah, in, in order to change the Articles of Confederation, all 13 colonies, or states at this point, they're no longer colonies, all 13 had to agree. And it is impossible. They are way too different. If we can remember back to when we had our northern colonies versus our southern colonies, what's going on in the south is so different than what's going on in the north. Um, and so it's, it's impossible. They were never able to change any of these problems because you can't get all 13 to agree. Now, you do have to have 9 of 13 in order to add a law, and they were able to do that one time with the Northwest Ordinance. And that was the only time they were able to do that because, it, again, it was really hard to get them, uh, to get everybody to, or even 9 of 13 to agree to change something. So, that's it. That's Unit 1. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know, or you can review any of these videos.